Hey there, everyone. It's episode 71 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best conversations about the martial arts, like today's conversation about the ways children benefit from quality martial arts instruction. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear and some excellent apparel and accessories for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you that are listening again. If you're not familiar with our products, you can learn more about them at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Now, today's episode is a little different from what we've done in the past. We had a member of the Whistlekick online community write in with a suggestion that we discuss the benefits of martial arts training for children, but from the idea that any martial arts training in any style can be a benefit to any child. We thought it was an interesting topic, but we thought we needed more than just my perspective. So we reached out to one of our past guests, Master Tanya Penizo. As a school owner, an instructor, a parent of a child in the martial arts, and also the pioneer of a really progressive autism spectrum disorder only class, we thought she'd have some good things to say. And she did. So check this out. Master Penizo, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me back. This will be fun. You're the first repeat. And of course, we're doing kind of a, a different episode, different format. You know, we're, we're not going to be telling your story today. Rather, just talk to you about something that you've got a good deal of experience with. Excellent. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready glad you right. are. I'm, I'm glad. So... The reason I wanted to have you back on, the, the subject I wanted to talk to you about was we keep having this subject come up on the show about martial arts and youth and how it can be so beneficial. And of course, you as a school owner and someone who works with youth at different ages, at different developmental abilities, I think you've got a good perspective. Um, you're also a parent, a parent of someone in martial arts. So I think you've got a bunch of different angles you can bring to the table mm -hmm. and we can hash this thing out. Sounds good. Sounds so good. So let's just go kind of way back. Let, let's, let's unpack this from the beginning. You know, I know you agree that martial arts is good for kids, but why, you know, if you had to boil that off? Well, I think, um, martial arts was good for kids for different reasons back in, back in the day. You know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there actually weren't a lot of kids in martial arts, even though I think it was really beneficial for them. Society as a whole was very different. I think more and more, though, as society changes, it's really a, a necessary activity for kids. Every kid that I've ever seen that's interacted in any kind of martial art, even if it was just for a very short period of time, has seen something really positive come out of that. I think for kids today, uh, in particular, kids that are struggling with obesity and poor health habits. I think that martial arts is a great avenue for them to participate in a physical fitness activity that isn't riddled with a lot of pressure of like a team. It's not necessarily a team sport, even though it has a team feel because it's a class. So they're able to progress in a lot of their fitness challenges and even some of their coordination challenges. Um, individually. And I think that that's something that's really beneficial to kids today, which is not really something that we saw 20 years ago, right? Kids were much more active. They were outside. So it wasn't really something that was necessary, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But I think today it's something that all kids can really benefit from. And even the kids that are very active, that are playing other sports, soccer, football, they benefit because of all of the coordination that is enhanced through the martial arts. Their balance, their flexibility, their hand-eye, foot-eye coordination helps propel them in their other sports too. So I think just going into the health and fitness aspect of that, it makes it beneficial for kids today. At least that's the primary reason. And I, I think outside of that, though, I think that it's one of the I don't want to just call it a sport because to me, martial arts is a more holistic thing than really just a sport. It, it involves obviously focusing their mind and developing their attitude in conjunction with their body. 
um, which other sports can do, but doesn't always have the, the focus on. But I think it helps really build their confidence and their self-esteem. And I think that's something that kids are really lacking today as well. Sure. And of course, you broke it down into the two components that I think most people would break martial arts instruction or, or maybe not instruction, but benefit to. You've got the physical component and then the, the non-physical, whether you want to term that as emotional or, or, or mental. Mm hmm. You know, there, there's really that that line down the center for both of those elements. <clears throat> Excuse me. And different children have different need, right? So some of them are going to be more lacking in the physical component. Some of them are going to be more lacking in that mental, emotional component. Mm -hmm. And martial arts, you know, supports and and fosters growth in both. Yep. Absolutely. And I think um, coaches have a really big influence on kids in all sports. The one thing, too, that I think is great, though, about martial arts is, well, the instructor has a lot of the same attributes as a coach, in particular on the sports side of most martial arts, on karate, taekwondo, jiu-jitsu, if they're competitive with it. But even in the classroom environment, they have a lot of the, the coaching attributes that you would see, like encouraging them, trying to keep them going. But what I think is also very different because it's still a classroom setting, is that there's still a parental aspect to a martial arts instructor that isn't always there with a coach. So there's a strong moral component that usually comes with most martial arts. Um, I'm a Taekwondo practitioner, but I also do jiu-jitsu, and, and the instructors in jiu-jitsu are the exact same way, talking about respecting each other, respecting authority, respecting themselves. And that's something that parents often try to instill in their kids. It's reinforced by their martial arts teacher. And then they're coached through their techniques and their fitness and everything else that's related to their martial art as well by the same person. So it's really nice because it's a, um, it's a balance, but at the same time, it's helping parents out at the same time. You know, because I think we all recognize that Oftentimes, the parents may not have the biggest influence on the kid, in particular in a certain age, and coaches and other teenage leaders have more influence. So if we're all speaking that same language, it really helps the child. Right. And one of the things that I've heard verbalized by, I can't even tell you how many parents over the years, is that, you know, the martial arts, that martial arts instructor role, because there isn't the governing body of a school board behind it, that instructor has a lot more leeway to adapt to what the child can need, assuming, of course, that it's a good instructor. Sure. And, you know, anyone that's ever worked with, with children, especially their own children, knows that as soon as someone else says something <laughs> right. to a child, they respond very differently, right, than, right. than when the parent tells the child. And so for a parent to say, you know, be respectful, clean up your room and all that, you know, it, it just kind of washes over them. It's, it doesn't really have an impact quite often, but the school teacher is not going to tell them those things, at least not in the blunt, direct way mm -hmm. that a martial arts instructor can. You right. know, we're in a time now where schools get sued frequently because of the way some parents respond to the way a teacher may right. act with their children. And of course, we, we've got to have these universal policies that apply across everyone. Right. Which really can can tie the hands of a lot of school teachers. So right. here the martial arts instructor steps in. Right. And there are still parents like that in martial arts, but a good instructor and a good gym owner will stand firm to their beliefs. And, um, you know, th there's like a normalization process that goes, um, that, that families will go through in any gym, right? That these are the rules of the dojang or the dojo. And, um, you know, we respect our parents in the seating area, not just our teachers on the mat. And um, a good gym owner is going to recognize, you know, the child or the student's behavior anywhere. Um, and that's what's really nice about the martial arts gym. There are coaches and other athletics that do that as well. But martial arts is is deeply rooted in that respect for others and authority. And so it's easy to build on that. What's really nice, too, though, that I have seen over the years um, are parents that have also learned how to 
help improve their behavior at home by recognizing some of their own deficiencies. An example of that would be a parent saying, wow, they listen to to you so well, Master Panizo. I mean, they don't ever listen like that at home. And, you know, I'll say something like, well, I don't count to five. I tell them, you know, ask them to do it once. And if they don't, I give them push-ups. And they know they're going to get the push-ups after that second or third time. So they just do it on the first try. Um, and then like a parent will say, you know, that's funny because I've counted to five or 10, like just 10 times, like the follow through is not there, you know? So I think sometimes parents will say that, like they will have their own recognition, um, that they are often not following through the way a coach or a teacher would. So that's how we kind of collaborate together. Um, and the, another example of that would be parents saying you're not testing for a belt if you don't make good grades in school and me reinforcing that as their Taekwondo teacher. You know, your parents, you know, have placed this requirement. You should do well in school. You're going to be delayed on your belt test. And that's how that community aspect can be beneficial to the child. And that's not always there, in particular in high school athletics, right? When um, when kids are not always performing well with either academics or what have you, but the sport is more important. And it, it shouldn't be that way, but in martial arts, a good do, a dojang a good dojang would not um, compromise the integrity of their program for that. Right, and I think that recognition that it's not about the sport, right? You know, it's not the the end result is not putting a kid up on a podium or getting them to win a race. It's about that child's development, right, or their and, belt test, right, or getting them the next rank, exactly. Right, right. So to recognize what really is important takes you know, someone who, who buys into that, of course, you know, whether it's a, an athletic coach or something. And, you know, I can't speak for all coaches or why everyone goes into coaching, but I know that when I was in high school, the majority of the coaches I had in my sports were living vicariously through us. There was something that they didn't accomplish when they were in high school athletics. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go back and revisit and, you know, for their own purposes. Right. And of course, they were driving us to that. And so there's that motivation, you know, for their own psychological satisfaction needs. Or, yeah, yep. satisfaction. And the priorities can skew. Right. But I, I want to go back to, to something you said, and I think it's it's really key. And, and I forgot the exact language you used, but about the martial arts instructors sticking to their guns, mm -hmm. you know, holding to what they believe is important. And a, that ability to not just let everyone into the program right you know when we're talking about school public school at least everyone has the right to be there mm -hmm. except in extreme circumstances any martial arts instructor can throw out any individual child or adult for any but legally protected reasons you know like gender right. and things like that right and it, it so it, it'll it gives so much more flexibility for building an environment that caters to those that want to be there versus those that have to be. Right. And I think oftentimes that may depend on where the martial arts school is, not only in um, whether or not it's in its infancy, is it a new school, a new program, or where it is demographically. I myself have, I think, five or six other taekwondo schools, literally within like a seven mile radius of me. So for me, um, the way I look at it is this is my dojang. This is, um, you know, how we do things here. And culturally, we want to keep everything intact. And that's really important to us because we think that ultimately that is how our school will grow. And, and there have been some that have not fit here um, and they go elsewhere. There's been some that have left and then come back. Like they recognize, oh, you don't know what you have until you leave it, you know. But um, so that may depend. You know, some businesses may really rely on their clientele and, you know, may make some of those sacrifices to the integrity of their program to keep their clientele. And that's the decision of the gym owner, or of the academy owner, right? They have to decide that. For me, um, you know, just as parenting is a balance between protection and exposure, that's really what it is. 
the dojang is um, a balance of you contributing to them and them contributing to you. That's really what it is. It's a, it's a mutual relationship. Um, as every family walks into the gym, they're contributing, you know, their time and their energy to your space and you have to meet them halfway, but not everybody fits. And the best thing a academy owner can do is refer them to another facility where they may better fit or get their needs met. Um, but I'm a 100% advocate of sticking to what you believe is right for your school and then the school will grow. Not everybody does though. <laughs> believe that. Right, right. And and I think, you know, it's it's interesting that one of the things that I wanted to bring up, and I'll, I'll tie this back in in a second, you know, here in the martial arts, we so often, so many people are are making the, the criticism of other styles, you know, it's, well, you know, jujitsu is better than karate, or taekwondo is better than Krav Maga, or, you know, whatever. I mean, those arguments happen all the time, you know, in bar rooms and on the internet. I mean, all you have to do is post any style comment on anybody doing martial arts on YouTube and, and you'll get bombarded. But here we have something that threads through all at least traditional styles of martial arts, the, the benefit to children. You know, it, it, it just, mm -hmm. it happens. It's there. I mean, you, you mentioned that, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter what style it is. It's, it's going to come through. Yeah. Well, I, but, I agree. Yep. Go ahead. No, go ahead. So th the thing that I think is really interesting is despite the fact that I think we can all admit that martial arts have differences, you know, Taekwondo is, is not the same as karate. And even your Taekwondo and my Taekwondo are going to be different just because we're training in different places. We could admit that, but we can't always admit as school owners that someone, a, a student may be a better fit at another school. Mm -hmm. And so to recognize that, to, to be strong enough in what you're trying to present and how you're trying to present it and recognize that there are going to be differences and that's not only okay, but it's beneficial to those involved mm -hmm. and to network and say, hey, this kid's gonna do better over here with that style of instruction. Right, right. No, I totally agree. And and I think too, for um it, it takes a it takes a martial arts owner that is secure with what they're teaching um to be able to do that. And there are many out there. I mean, there of course are some that are not. I think it's the same way for other athletics. I do agree. I mean, I had played school sports, I had amazing coaches that really helped develop me, not just athletically, but as a person as well. And um, I think that school sports were wonderful for me in that regard. I do feel, though, that because I was doing martial arts at the same time, that I did have an edge over others that were not. And a lot of that was related to persistence and dedication and um, my work ethic, because that was something that was ingrained in me in the martial arts. But I think, too, that you know, not every gym owner is comfortable doing that. It takes a strong person to do so. But as long as you are focused on the student and what is going to benefit the student, even if that means that they leave, not all competitive programs are the same. Not all gyms offer classes that can help the child. We offer ASD classes here, but I'm the only school in the area that does so. So um, what's ASD? Um, those that auti know? Autism spectrum disorder. So like those that are on the spectrum, Asperger's, autism, we have particular classes um, of various levels for those students, but not all Taekwondo or, or karate schools can teach kids that have special needs. And to say that um, you do when you really can't, or they could be better served somewhere else is really not true to what martial arts is anyway, right? Because it's all about um, being true to you helping others. So not everybody is there, but I think that in martial arts and then in other sports, there there are a good number, you know, out there that will hopefully want to benefit the student, even if that means that, you know, they're not participating within their own school. Sure. So you've mentioned that, you know, you've had your school for a period of time. 
And I'm sure that you do some things differently now than you did when you started with regards to children and teaching children. Yep. So if we've got somebody out there that's listening that maybe wants to to implement some changes or or they're new, you know, give us a couple things that people can do to help grow a strong and successful youth program. Well, for me, it comes down to something my <laughs> my dad said related to parenting. Um discipline with love and love with discipline. So kids need to know that they will be disciplined and by whom. And they also need to know that they will be loved and accepted and by whom. So as a Taekwondo teacher, by love, I don't necessarily mean like parental love with the hug and kiss and all that type of stuff. But what I mean is they need to know that they are accepted by you no matter what. Um, So high fives, we use the word yes a lot in my dojang um, because we do want to reinforce what they do well. Um, What we also do is we scale our discipline in the dojang. So when kids begin, we keep it very fun and very positive. Um, As I mentioned, we use the word yes a lot in correction. Um, It's not that we're afraid of the word no. I mean, I'm not afraid of the word failure or no or anything like that. Um, But we try to keep a very fun and positive atmosphere in our beginner level. And then intermediate, we begin to start um, sprinkling in a more stern way about running a class, a more structured way. We still have that positive reinforcement, but now the expectation has been raised and we grade them up accordingly. Once they get to the advanced level, they're now inspected from head to toe. They're expected to be there on time. They're expected to look a certain way. And we still have fun in the class, but they have been slowly normalized through that disciplinary process. You can't bring kids in on the first week and give them you know, push-ups for not knowing something. Um, you have to kind of break them in and normalize them through the process. And I think, too, um, another thing that we do is we break the class into four four segments. There are three curriculum items and one thing that's considered just fun. Now, the curriculum items could be fun to kids, but um, we always finish with fun. So it might be puzzle tag on the mats, um, some other games. We have like a red light, green light that we play related to Taekwondo techniques. And all of those kids think that those things are fun and they're learning in the process. And it's just a way to balance it out. And we always finish with that element so that when they get off the mat, their last impression is, hey, that was fun. (laughs) And I'll be honest, I learned that from my daughter's gymnastics class because they would spend, you know, an hour on beam and an hour on bar and then an hour on the vault or whatever they would do in her class. And then they finish by jumping in the pit, the big foam pit. And, um, as bored as she looked through everything else, she always came out saying it was great because she got to jump in the foam pit. <laughs> right. So I, right. I think it's the way you finish. And um, so that's something that we do here. I don't know if that is what other gyms do, um, but it's a methodology that has really worked for us. And um, the kids do very well here. Great. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, thanks for coming back on the show and, and giving us your expertise. No, thank you for having me. What did you think of that? It's a different format for sure. No planned questions. It's shorter. And you certainly got to hear more of my opinions than you do in a normal show. Feedback is, of course, always appreciated. So please leave us a comment somewhere, either on the website or on social media. You can find the show notes and a place for comments at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And as to social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you want to be a guest on the show, or maybe you have an idea for a show topic like we did with today's show, if you do, go ahead and fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we're doing. You can learn more about our products at whistlekick.com. That's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.